Okay, so we are starting these sort of compendium of notes from chapter 20, and now we're going to talk about the ecology of populations. So we've talked about the, how populations evolve, and, and we're kind of going backwards to talk about um, the ecology of populations, but really what we're going to see is that it's the ecology of the populations that drives the evolution. So you kind of learn the mechanisms of the evolution, and now we're going to look at why those mechanisms exist in the first place. Um, I, I kind of like doing it this way, better than the way we used to do it. Um, so this is, you know, the front of this chapter in your book gives a little thing about um, glo human global population. Do you know how many humans there are on the planet? Uh, more or less 7 billion. Yeah, more or less 7 billion. Um, and the time for that population to double keeps getting smaller. Um, Human growth, if we graph it, looks like this. You'll probably want to remember that shape. Um, and we'll, we'll actually look up some, some images of human growth. So you know that population is a group of organisms belonging to the same species living in the same place at the same time like for the 43rd time Moser let it go but that's what it is so one of the things that we would be remiss I would be remiss not to talk about is the fact that um, all of you eat <laughs> all of you poop um, all humans on the planet do um, some humans on the planet eat a lot less than we do um, Americans um, tend to get more calories than humans in a lot of other parts of the world. And we'll briefly at the end talk about developed versus developing nations, which again, I think you do in social studies. Um, all those people got to pull their calories from someplace. And whether you're going out and hunting and killing your own food very personally or not, which not as many humans do today in the U.S. Um, now, what I love about teaching where I teach is I have plenty of people who have eaten something they killed or they grew or they found in the wild or, you know, their mom or their dad or their uncle or their brother or, you know, their grandma found in the wild. So we, we still have this wonderful sort of Appalachian hunter-gatherer um, sideline culture, which is awesome. I love that. There, if, if I taught in Boardman, the percentage of students I had who had ever eaten something they killed would be a lot lower. The percentage of students who had eaten something they grew or that they found in the wild would be a lot lower. How many of you have ever eaten something that you or someone in your immediate family killed? Deer, rabbit, groundhog, woodchuck? Okay. Um, how many of you have ever eaten food that some you or somebody in your family grew in a home garden or on an apple tree or something? How many of you have ever eaten something that you or an immediate member of your family found in the wild, like morels or wild greens or awesome? Okay, see the numbers get smaller for each of those categories, but um, that's why I like us. I like our little Appalachian culture we got going. We get the best of both worlds. It's pretty cool. Um, all those seven billion humans on the planet got to eat. And even though most humans in the U.S. these days get most of their food from a store, and they're not real involved with its production, with its death, um, those calories still come from out in the world. And there's a limited amount of energy in the world. And the calories that a deer or a cow consume come from the world, and the calories that um, a corn tortilla represents come from out in the world. So it's just a thing to think about, that there are limits to energy on this planet, and we've got a lot of mouths to feed, things to consider. So, moving beyond the, what might sound like the, the intro notes to a doomsday speech, it's not. There are three big things that we're going to talk about with populations as we study populations and their ecology, and those are size, density, and dispersion. Size is the easiest one to measure. Size is really easy to, it's not too hard to measure, but it's pretty easy to estimate also. Has anybody here ever estimated a population of anything in their life? <coughs> okay, what'd you estimate, Grant? Uh, ants. Oh, 
cool at home or in school? Cool. Was this like a family project? These ants are driving me insane. Somebody figure out how many there are. We got away from the ant farm. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I'm thinking like the little black ants I get on my counter every spring. Okay. Because <laughs> I hate them. I don't care how many of them there are. I just want them all dead. Um, and I don't kill stuff. I kill them. Okay, so you had an ant farm and you were trying to figure out how many ants were in there. How'd you do it? Okay. How many tunnels and... Okay. And then how many ants were in each tunnel? Yeah. I think there was like nine ants in that, that seems like that's a low number. Okay. I wish you get an ant farm for in here. Did they last long? Did they die out? They died. Okay. Um, so, I, I may have mentioned once or twice my former occupation as a fish squeezer. Yes. Squeezing fish for eggs and sperm. Coming home smelling like fish slime all, all spring long. Woo! Ugh, I loved it. Um, one of the things, did I mention also that when we got those fish up in the net, we had to tell the, the boat captain after every net how many males and how many females we had? So, you know, you're pulling walleye out with the net, they're getting slapped in a pan, you're grabbing walleye, you're sticking their nose in your armpit, you're squeezing their belly, <clears throat> and you're also having to keep a mental count. So after you've cleared that net, the captain says to each of us, okay, what was your count? Uh, and I, I can, I'll be honest, I lost count plenty of times. My numbers were close, they were not perfect, human error was big. Um, 26 females, 13 males. Okay. And you also had to do remarks. Let's talk about why that is. So population size is just how many individuals there are in a population. This is the thing that everybody thinks population means, because that's how we use it in conversation. But it's really population size. Now, who here has ever been to any of our wonderful reservoirs in Ohio. We got lots of reservoirs. We got a lot of dam lakes. Okay. Why do I call them dammed lakes? Most of them are not natural lakes. Most of them are created by a dam that backs up water. Also called reservoirs. Um, we have a few natural lakes in Ohio, but not many. Who's been out on Guilford? Highland Town. Mosquito? Anybody been on Mosquito or Pima Tuning? Oh, Pima Tuning, that's right. Um, Huh, I should have a picture. So Guilford's a nice sized lake. I've spent a lot of time, many happy hours fishing on Guilford, many happy hours paddling a kayak or a canoe on Guilford. It's a big lake. It pales in comparison to Mosquito. Mosquito is gigantic. I'm not sure which is bigger, Pima Tuning or Mosquito. They're both enormous. Big lakes. Um, Berlin Reservoir, anybody been on Berlin? We did musky on Berlin, we did walleye on Mosquito. So, you, Division of Wildlife, who has a fishing license? You guys don't have to buy them yet. Stinkers. Turn 16, you got to start buying a license. Who here goes fishing? Okay. Now, if you go fishing, you still have to abide by the catch limits. What's a catch limit? Yeah. How much you can keep, and I haven't had a, I mean, I've been out of Ohio for five years now, so I don't know what the current catch limits are, but there used to be, like, limits on bass, and there would be limits on bluegill. Bass were the big ones, though. Um, we could look them up. But Division of Wildlife says you can only have this many fish of this species. How do they set that? How do they set it? Well, they look at how big the population in the lake is. So they're basing that on population size. And um, deer are another good example. Um, who here went deer hunting this year? Okay, a few of you. And the bag limit is down this year, isn't it? I remember, so we were still, I think it was 2012, because I remember the kid I had in class. It was 2012, because I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, and the bag limit for Columbiana County, <clears throat> if you added up everything, if you added up, you know, buck and antlerless and 
bow season and muzzle loader and you know youth whatever everything you could take six deer just like several freezers full and I remember <laughs> his face I can remember his name but I won't say it because I I protect the an anonymity of my former students so if you say something funny that gets used in stories later on I won't say your name either um, so I remember him saying to me you know tomorrow's the last day of season I said I know he said got five deer so far. I said, oh, that's good. And he said, I think I'm going to be sick. Uh-huh. I'm sure you are. He was planning on spending the last day of season out in the woods trying to get the sixth deer because he hadn't met his bag limit. It's a huge, crazy bag limit. What is it this year? Somebody said it in their research. Three? Okay. And that's adding up every possible opportunity you could do. That's gotten cut in half. How do they set that? How do they decide? It's based on the population size. It's based on population size. And you look at, we want the population to stay stable. We want it to grow. We want it to shrink. We have too many. We don't have enough. OK. Same way fishing um, limits are set. So when I worked for the division, and we would go out on big boats, and we would squeeze fish for eggs and sperm, and we would tell the, the crew captain how many we had, those numbers would go back to the biologists at Division of Wildlife who would estimate populations. Because you can't count every fish in a lake. Anybody have a pond at home with fish in it? Have you stocked it? Or did they just show up because they do that? Okay. Um, do you have any idea how many fish you have in your pond? Do you, have, do you know what all the species? Have you done exhaustive sampling? Can we come to your house and sample if we bring bait? We'll bring our own bait. No? Okay. Um, you can't count all the fish in a body of water. So how do you, how do you get a population estimate? You're never going to have an exact number. How do you get an estimate? Maybe you just walk off a certain spot and then count that many in that area. Okay. Fish move a lot, don't they? That's a problem. Deer are pretty mobile. How do we get a population estimate? Granted a population estimate on his ants, but then they died anyway. Okay, so you could, you could go out and, you know, if you're stocking walleye, like we were stocking walleye, you know, how many walleye we put out in the lake, how many we expect to survive to the end of the first year. Okay, that's an option. What else could we do? So we can sort of block off a section and count what's there and extrapolate from there. We can count offspring. What else can we do? With, with deer, Division of Wildlife, their work is made easier by everybody who goes out in the woods and takes a deer because how do you report that? Cameron, how do you report that you got it? Yeah, you take your tag to a check station and that information goes back to Division of Wildlife and they go, oh, okay, we've got, you know, a doe in Fairfield Township. We've got a buck in Elk Run Township. Do they do weight on those? Okay, so they do weight, sex, what else, what other information do they collect on the tag? That's it, weight and sex. Okay, so they can get a sense of, you know, we have a ton of big bucks in Elk Run Township. Um, we're seeing largely very small does in Middletown Township. You start to get data. So for fish, Okay, so when we have a population and we can't count them all, we can't count all the deer in Ohio, we can't count all the fish in Mosquito Lake, we do what's called sampling. And it's, it's kind of what Grant, Grant, what Garrett said, or what Grant said actually, you were counting how many ants are in a tunnel, counting how many tunnels you got. Um, your idea is, you know, block off a section of lake, count how many fish you've got there. How big is that compared to the area of the lake? When I worked for Division of Wildlife, we had those nets underwater. So it's a big, long tunnel net. And it had wings that sort of forced the fish into it. So it, in essence, gathered fish from a given area of lake. They would spread those out evenly through the lake, figure out how, you know, what, 
kind of area that would draw fish in from. How does that compare to the total area of the lake? Okay, in one day you get this many female walleye and this many male walleye in that section. They do some mathematical magic and they can come up with a fairly surprisingly actually accurate estimate of how many fish there are in the lake of a given species. The other thing we did, and you're going to do a lab tomorrow, sort of a quick lab. When we caught the fish, and this sounds cruel and horrible, we, ha we had to keep a pair of um, like hedge clippers in our pocket. And every time you caught a fish, you cut off the top corner of their tail. They heal, and they're not, it's not terribly, it doesn't have a whole lot of nerves running through it. Like, I never saw them jump. Um, it always, I, I felt terrible doing it, but <laughs> clip, clip, clip. So, when you caught it for the first time, you clipped the top corner. If you caught it, if you caught one whose top corner was already clipped, you clipped the bottom. And you also, in addition to telling your captain how many females, how many males, you would say how many recaptures. And from that, they could build a good estimate for the number of fish in the lake. Okay, with that, we're going to stop here. Tomorrow, we're going to do a lab on mark and recapture. And